Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. And uh, generally, good day all round, I think. Yeah. 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 Good all tomorrow. Day. Hello, 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 hello. And welcome to Ben and Declan on a roll. Uh, long time fans, keen uh, eyed, eagle eyed watchers will see that there's something different today. Declan got a haircut. I did. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I am not at home right now. Uh, I am currently uh, minding a dog. So I, there's a couple of things you should know, a couple of housekeeping before we get into the episode. I am on my phone, which means I can't see the stream and I can't see chat. So you're going to have to shout really loud when you type so I can hear it in the distance. So what I'm hearing is this is the perfect time to get away with just slagging the absolute crap out of Ben in chat. So if you're in chat, give us your best Ben-based digs. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can just type things in quotes and say I said them. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Actually, that's actually even better. Yeah, let's let's get him done for slander. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, uh, we won't be talking uh, slander today. We are talking creativity. In fact, we're on a creativity spree for this episode, for the next episode, and a little bit for the last episode too. And actually, is a running thread throughout this entire show because we love talking about it. But specifically for the next three, we're going to focus on uh, different types of creativity in role play. Uh, how to find creativity in moments in your game. Uh, there's also the the inevitable kind of dark side to that too. We're going to talk about creative burnout a little bit in about two episodes time. And actually, um, if you have opinions on creative burnout, if you uh, have thoughts, if you have experience with it, we are. It's it's not something that's unique to to a couple of people. I think we we all feel it when we give something we love our all. We are at risk of uh burning the midnight oil burning the candle at both ends burning out i suppose is a good way to put it so we're going to try and put together as many people as possible uh sending in little clips whether it's like a voice note to us whether it's a video clip whether it's even just a message in text and we can read it out of all the different ways to experience burnout so we get a kind of full picture of it now here's the funny thing we realize the irony of asking people to do stuff that takes time and effort and creativity when talking about a thing which is um, not having that in you to do. So uh, we are very aware of the irony of we're going to talk about creative burnout. Let's ask a lot of creatives and add things to their workload in place. Uh, so please do not feel pressured or otherwise. Um, when we get to that episode, I think it will become very clear that even posting something online, even replying to someone in a text or even things that seem like they're low effort can feel like the most momentous task in the world. And that's kind of the danger burn it. But that's not today. Today is creativity, role play, perform performance at the table and mechanics. And as I rather crudely put earlier in a, a social media video, are they oil and water? Or they like mayonnaise. Will they emulsify to a? I'm, uh, if anyone knows me, I have a fear of mayonnaise, so I'm not going to finish that sentence. I find the stuff gross. Um, but yes, can we mix oil and egg and vinegar and make something that some people find delicious, but not me? Um, that's the hub for today. We also have a special guest. We have an interview with Jacob Wolf Lepton. And no more than today would it be very clear that these things are pre-recorded because we'll cut to me in a suit in the usual room. I can talk to me in uh, in a house where I'm running a dog. So um, you'll know that this isn't uh, <laughs> me running upstairs quickly changing and then sitting down. Which, <laughs> sitting oh down no, <laughs> everyone's seeing behind the curtain. Our professionalism is ruined. <laughs> the illusion is ruined. <laughs> Um, I, and then Declan's going to share some inspiration. Sorry, you probably just expect to say that. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, no, it's fine. No, no, no. I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm look, I'm just the looks on Ben and Declan on a roll. I'll, I'll just, I'm just the pretty one that sits in the corner going, "Oh, you," and that's, mm. that's no, I, um, I like, it, it is. I, I was saying to Ben uh, a, a little bit before the, as we were kind of setting up the stream and stuff that. I, me and mechanics are 
Well, if you've watched anything I've ever DM'd, you'll go, uh, oh, Declan does think they're oil and water. Um, I, it's one of those things that I, 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 love, I love to play with them, but in all, always in that vein of how is this going to help the story? How is this going to be a fun little thing that we do? Um, and I'm so guilty of, um, and, and Ben would know this because he's been in my house, but like I have uh, directly above my station where I'm working at the moment, I have a... Um, a wall that is just filled with TTRPG books and systems, uh, all of which are largely unplayed. Um, and I, I buy them because I'm like, oh, that sounds really interesting. That sounds. And then I pick it up and I'm like, uh, I have to learn this. Oh, this is different. And then I watch someone else do it. I'm like, oh, God, that's really easy. I'll do that. That's not that bad. Uh, so I think, yeah, there's. There's a lot in this that we're going to unpack because um, there's stuff that Ben and I don't necessarily agree on as well when it comes to the mechanics of stuff. So there might be drama. Uh, there could be drama. There, might be. Uh, there could be. Could be the um, first time ever. This, this could be the end of Ben and Declan on a roll. Um, there might be Declan Ben hit on a roll. roll. Declan on a roll <laughs> separately. Um, Until years from now, we, we announce the comeback tour. Our surge pricing goes through the roof and there's a big old scandal. As everyone wants to see the two guys back together <laughs> doing all the hits. <laughs> Definitely. Well, maybe. <laughs> Getting creative. That one episode on fantasy. and <laughs> Do those again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's it's such like... It, because it, you know, it's horses for courses uh, when it comes to these things, um, and there's lots I've of. I've never to... heard that phrase, "horses for courses." You've never heard the phrase "horses for courses." No. Oh God! Please no, tell no, me no, that's no. a thing. Please tell me that's a thing, and I have not just been going around to people going. So you know, it's like horses for courses, uh, where people are like, "Oh yeah, yeah," because everyone usually agrees with me when I say that. Um, mm -hmm. I've never had. Oh God! If you're in chat, it has to be a. I, no more have I wished I could see chat to see if I'm in the wrong no, or you're in the wrong. There's, there's nobody in chat except Twiggy B11 <laughs> Now, I've, I've, I've never heard it before except from you. Okay. So technically, Great Grey's World 2005. Nope, never heard it. Um, right. Okay. Um, I think I may have invented an idiom. Um, well, it's like horses for horses, really. <laughs> I'm cutting this so I'm done with you. <laughs> What does it what does it mean? So like you know like um like like every course so like every race track there's a good horse for that race so like horse for course. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah yes. I yes. So it's um okay. <laughs> this suits really well in this situation but not always. Every horse yes. every dog will have their day. Yes, but I say horses for yeah. horses, which is a normal right. thing to say. It sounds like you're eating the horses. That's what <laughs> Multiple horses for different mm. horses. When are you serving the horse course? Um, we've had our starter, but where's the horse we're course actually, coming? We're actually starting this evening with a little demure Shetland pony uh, uh, to yeah. start off the to, to wet the palate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it's a real saying. It's out there. Um, and Stop trying to make courses for courses. <laughs> Stop trying to make it happen. That's going to be the new Benedict on a roll snack. <laughs> Benedict on a roll. Horses for courses, don't you know? Uh, um, but no. I that's a real thing, and I didn't make that up. I will be googling it during the interview to prove to um, an amuse hoof. Sorry, uh, so just so you know, Twiggy B one one wrote the three words "an amuse hoof" in chat. Very good. That's the horses courses. Right. I'm a just, little. I'm, I'm going to cut to the interview hoof. with Jacob now because I. Well, think... I should say before we get to this interview. <laughs> um, uh, so you know the way we do very tight fit minute uh, interviews on the show yeah. um that's our style we keep this to a tight hour and our interviews are only 15 minutes so up and jake spoke for no word of a lie uh, just under an hour i think 57 minutes uh dear viewers dear people in chat dear people watching the vod you are not about to watch an hour-long interview i have cut it down the unfortunate thing is we've lost a lot of good stuff in there so you won't notice the cuts like i'm they're pretty good i'm pretty good at editing you won't even you barely even notice where the cuts are uh so it won't be jarring at all oh, to jump from topic to topic um so you'll be you'll be fine it's easy to keep up um but there's a couple of things in there that will i'll probably instead of spoiling it i'm gonna ask jacob to come back on because we went into this really nice talk about michael Chekhov, who is a theater practitioner um, and how to use sort of theater techniques because we're both theater nerds. We nerded out of a theater for a long time. That's why we ended up talking for a lot. Um, and I might ask 
Jacob, if they're around, to come back and specifically talk about like techniques and tools and tricks that you can bring to your table. Not unlike the, you know, five, four, three, two, one grounding techniques, if you're finding it very emotional, uh, which shouldn't mention something I know fractions about, but I believe it's five things you can see, four things you can, another sense. It ends with one thing you can touch. So in between, I think four things you can hear, uh, three things you can smell, probably it's not taste. Yeah, how people... right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, so there is a lot missing in this interview. Unfortunately, you're not getting the full thing. If we were smart and we had like some sort of paywall, that's where we put it, uh, but no. So please do enjoy it. And uh, I wanted to flag any potential cuts um, because I, I'm, I was ruthless. I just <laughs> that your keen <laughs> so. eye may spot like you I doubt mean... it I, I very much doubt it you'll you'll not notice it all um are we are we good to go yeah i, I was just yeah asterisk over but now it's done <laughs> check it out hello <laughs> and a very special on a roll welcome to our guest this episode jacob wolf lefton thank you so much for joining us the audience will know this because we would have cut live from the studio but well, we're here to talk about role play, performativity in role play, mechanics and crunchiness, and how we get left brain, right brain, and all those lovely kind of parts working together for a beautiful, harmonized, full 360 experience at the table. But before we get into questions, chats, and the nerdy details, why don't you tell anyone who's not familiar with you a little bit about yourself, where you're from, your TTRPG background, and, and your performance background? Woo. <laughs> uh, I'm hi. I'm Jacob Wolf Lefton. I am an actor. Um, I'm a performer, and I do some amount of writing and filmmaking and stuff. I do a lot of different things, creative things with my life. Um, and I'm from the United States, uh, from the East Coast, and I live now in Berlin, Germany, which is kind of a place where I've been trying to carve out in the European scene, where can I do actual play TTRPG? Because the US is evening hours are a little bit inaccessible unless I want to have like a night job, which I have a kid, so it's not possible. Um, and then my TTRPG background and performance background both kind of come from the same place, which is childhood. Um, I've literally been playing TTRPG. It's one of the things I've been doing the longest in my life. My earliest memory is like four years old playing bunnies and burrows with stuffed animals as the minis at some science fiction convention. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, second edition, RuneQuest, um, uh, other games coming through in college, playing a lot. And then, uh, yeah, and then as an adult, just consistently. And then I moved to Germany and left it all behind for like two years. I had a, a D20 shaped hole in my heart when I didn't have a role playing game for like the first time in my life. Um, and then I got into AP. I started watching it around um, like before the pandemic started, but then I got into the performing stuff during the pandemic, which I think is the sort of normal story. But it, for me, the performance aspect of it is a natural extension of my interest in performing in general, because when I really leaned into studying acting and becoming an actor, I realized that the root of it was my imagination and play as a child. And that the role playing drove my love for acting uh, and vice versa. My love for acting drove my love for role playing. It's this idea of like being in the character. And so um, I, you know, as a as a youth, I was in theater groups and I did backstage. I did on stage. I did uh, like theater camp, but it was like role playing theater camp called um, it's now Wayfinder. It's sort of like people know of this. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was there right before it turned into Wayfinder. Um, and so that was pretty impactful as a teenager, transformative, like study improv during the day and run around in the woods with elf ears and foam swords and werewolves at night. Super great. Um, and, and now in Berlin, I also uh, practice and perform 
long form improv, which I find is a great tool for how to hold these these longer improvisational stories. Um, and I've also dabbled in game design. So I'm sort of like all around this field in a way. With all of that combined with you, it it really comes across when you're playing. Uh, and I've since since seeing you on streams dipped into Tales Held Dear. Um, and it's true there too when you're GMing that it's an effortless kind of grasping of what I like to call like truths of the moment, um, which is probably a real term, um, but you're not struggling in those times when the spotlight or the proverbial scene turns to you to be like, well, what would be true? And that aspect of it is a result of the investment when it comes to an AP where it's not a you'll never believe I got this like flaming sword of kick assness and I got to take the final blow on the dragon who was this ancient thing. It's not that moment that sucks me in that has that soul pull for me. It's the everything that led up to there. I was, yeah. I'm, I know that you didn't start with that kick ass sword. I know that the dragon has like wiped out your town. I know that this moment, this like very satisfying, emotionally charged and narratively important moment is what makes it so incredible and makes it, because you're you're kind of there at the table uh, alongside with them. You're an active observer, mm -hmm. um, and I think separates it out from, you know, forum stories where it's like this incredible thing happened at our table, which is incredible for all of you. Um, just doesn't translate as well without having the years of friendship and context that you couldn't possibly give me in a an anecdote or a thread. Yeah, um, this is something that I uh, that I have kind of like created for myself as a piece of theory of why what I like what I'm looking for in an actual play when I go to watch or listen to one and also what I want to highlight when I'm making them as well one of the things um, and I believe it is something that people who theorize like academics who actually write theory of this stuff talk about as well which is that the people at the table are a first audience to what's being created in addition to uh, playing the, the character. And there's an element of like being able to watch their enjoyment and their emotional up and down and feeling like you're in with them. Um, there's this weird like sub discourse around uh, parasociality in role playing games, in actual play. Uh, where people are like, we need to get rid of it. But I actually, I think the more I think about it, like there's some aspect of the parasociality that um, is required in a way to create that sense of I'm at a gaming table with friends and I'm watching this and I get their emotional impacts and I can have that journey with them. Mm. Anyway, that's like, that's like getting into theory stuff and maybe people will want to fight me on it, but I'm happy for that discussion. When I first started Homebrew, we kind of had two two rules. Rule zero is we're here to have fun. Rule one is um, we're not alone. If there's an audience listening, watching, people are given a precious time. They could be doing anything else. They could be mm -hmm. watching The Wire. Apparently, it's amazing. Like yeah. they could be watching anything, and yet they're spending time with you, and that's precious and should be respected. Um, and that's the thing I had from from theater. Anyway, it's like people have spent money, they spent time, they've spent something, a resource that they have. Yeah. And they spend it with you. Yeah. I'm looking for a thing on my desktop because I agree with that. And it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. But also, uh, I have this Miyazaki quote where he's like, it's from the internet. Who knows if it's real? But apparently, like the Pixar, a Pixar person asked Miyazaki, like, when you when you make changes, uh, when do you make changes for you and when do you make changes for the audience? And Miyazaki was like, I never think about the audience. And so mm -hmm. there's like also a question around art and artistic process. And uh, for me, like goes into my acting work, which is uh, these are tangentially related to the questions, but um, it goes into my, my acting position, which is like um, there has to be an internal beauty to me as the first as the first audience and as the director, as the first director of whatever comes out. Um, it has to be. For me, it has to be a piece of art. And so for me, it has to have a beauty to it before even it gets to anybody else. So with that in mind, I was wondering if I could ask uh, my first question. And it's, since you've been talking, I've already in mentally added more to the list I sent you. Uh, no some problem, very no nerdy and fun. Um, <laughs> but my first one is, 
how do you prep a character? And if you wanted to use uh, Kevin from the mailroom as an example, feel free to, uh, yeah. but you don't have to. Yeah, let me talk about Kevin specifically because he's <laughs> like what brought us here in the first place. Um, whew, uh, all of my characters, whenever I make a character for me personally, it has to be narratively grounded. I just am uninterested if it's not narratively grounded. And that's a personal position. And it also impacts my, like when I DM something um, or when I join a game, I'm desperate to know about the world and about the other characters or things that other people are thinking so that I can find how do I fit in and what are my relationships to this so that it's relevant to me and I have things to like build on and play with. Otherwise, like the worst sort of position to be in is to be handed a character who's a blank slate who's like yeah i have no past or i don't remember it or i've run away from everything and i don't want to engage with it and i just want to go forward and sort of be like okay well we have to unpack that because all of what you're going to do next is determined by what you do before um and so this is this is deeply important and i think it's um one of the things that draw one of the things that drove Kevin, um, because we have this tournament, right? And this is just, it, on the outset, it's at this crunchy, like, hey, we're in competition. I'm not, I don't do competition well, because if I like really allow myself to be competitive, I'm going to be really, really competitive. But then I get, I turn into like an asshole and I don't want to be that. And I really, I'm not really a competitive person. I want to have fun. Um, uh, there's like, I have fun win, have fun, yes. win, you know, right? Yes. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, if it's, I have to give it like a good shot, you know, and D&D &D is a bit technical. Um, I find that as a system, it, yeah, you can, once you get into those higher levels, like we were level 10, so you can start to get a little bit, you can play with it. Uh, I have a background in, we played Shadowrun for many years at home. And um, I would spend six hours making a character, just like point buying every single little thing. And our group was so uh, tuned into how the game worked that like if you didn't show up at the table with a character who was rolling dice pools of over 10, 13, 15 in each of their like primary skills, you just weren't going to be able to operate at the level of their of the party. And so you had to you had to show up with these fine tuned characters. Um, which meant that like my wild ideas of like trying to make, I, I had an idea for a character that was like a combat lawyer where in a gunfight, they'd be like, hey, is your team following this code? Our lawyers are going to be in touch and then like get them to stop shooting at you. Our DM wasn't, didn't get it. And <laughs> the character didn't work because the system was like, you can't have an intellectual and a mm. physical combat person. They don't. So with this tournament, I was just kind of like looking at it like, okay, how how do you want me to play? It wasn't really um, super defined. Uh, I asked and and uh, Declan said, hey, it's basically we want to show the audience a good time. And I was sitting there thinking like, okay, cool, because the way to win is like greater invisibility and uh, flight and then uh, whoever I'm against is fucked. And that was the strategy of the winning uh the winning mm. person, basically. I looked at that and I was like, okay, cool, I could do that. Um, but that's that's not interesting or fun to me to play. I feel personally not, like it doesn't connect to anything. And I think that Grabo character had something that was connecting to that player and there was like a mm. clear role playing going on. And so it was like fascinating to watch. But for me, I was like, hmm, what do I do? What's fun? Well, fun is the back and forth of dice rolling. So what mechanics exist to make people re-roll dice? And so I just did like a deep dive. I searched online and then I went through all of like the skills and spells and whatever of like, what can I have in terms of class abilities and luck and uh, like background abilities and lineage or race or species or whatever you're calling them um, so that I have as many options as possible to make people myself included, re-roll or add or subtract numbers to the dice. Because that could, if I won't, even if I won't win, if I'm like this like wimpy little sorcerer, it'll at least be fun to fuck with people mm. and fun for the audience to watch. Um, and then I was like, okay, cool. This is a bit hapless. Like this poor sorcerer is obviously not supposed to be here. So 
I don't know why I just was like, I'm going to riff on the structure of this. And um, I think this is where the inspiration comes in of like, okay, this person is like an intern or whatever, uh, and they're stuck here and they're just like a chaotic loose cannon who's not supposed to be like, they're, they're the gremlin, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so they're either from IT or from wherever. And I was like, mailroom, it's Kevin from the mailroom. Uh, they're, they're 10th level, but it's all, uh, what was it? I, I said, um, uh, they've only worked at entry level positions. So it's like they're 10, they're level 10, but it's all entry level 10, you know? Mm. Um, and so that's sort of how it, how it came together. And then I sat down and I did the real crunchy work, which I, I kind of love of like getting in and building the character and like being like, okay, if I do this combination of, of, uh, you know, feats and skills and this level build, then I can get, oh, I can add two levels of wizard here and get this extra ability and I don't lose too much over here and all of this stuff. And that, uh, I think that comes from my like rune quest and shadow run and other crunchy, um, character building. Um, and also just a long time as a kid of like in between games of just building characters. I think someone wrote some piece of like thought online once where they were like, Oh, building characters is like solo play. And so if we count that in, then I've done a ton of it. I've done so many mm. character builders and whatever. So it just was like, great. I get to sink into this. I get to have fun with character building. And with each of them, uh, I get to kind of like justify it of like, okay, it's Kevin from the mailroom. He's kind of chaotic. Uh, he has no idea what's going on. So chaos, uh, wild magic, is it, it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Not only was it a very well put together character, but it was flavored in really nice ways. So like Tasha's uh, caustic uh, yes. brew, caustic potions, yes. were coffees, were coffees from the, you know, as in that style of the intern, it was these hot coffees that you were spilling over the place. Um, mirror image wasn't just, you know, that Dragon Ball Z, like three people, it was yeah. looking busy. And I yeah. think those little touches are what allow you to take a little bit extra in a turn because the thing that fills me with dread is when this happens during a game okay i attack um okay i'll roll all my attacks at once and i'll just roll the damage just in case they hit okay right um plus 10 there did i use sharpshooter uh this okay that would be 15 and uh 27 mm -hmm. um and actually that's also 12 and 14 and the dms they're going damage to, to hit <laughs> what yeah. are these numbers you're Whereas adding those little flavors, like I cast Mirror Image and Kevin begins to look busy as all these things are happening, means that as people are picturing that in their head, they go, oh, that's really nice. Gives you that little bit of mental space to go, roll, add, and then this will be this amount of damage. Mm -hmm. um, you, you do a wonderful verbal sleight of hand, which distracts the audience with flavor, giving yourself the time to do the crunch. Um, and it's a skill I'm li I'm just going to mimic from now on. I'm going to go, how do I buy myself time to think flavor? And so with that, in, with that sort of in mind, is there anything you consciously do? So these are things I'm trying to consciously bring to the table. Is there anything that you consciously do um, when playing to give yourself the space to both balance mechanics and role play? Or it's also fine to answer, no, Ben, I'm just naturally talented, <laughs> which is fine. <laughs> Uh, well, I have to say, like, um, I'm looking at my prep sheet for Kevin, mm. and I also have, like, my my actual physical record that I did, mm. you know, actually crossing out bubbles and stuff for the different spells and sorcery points, and, um, yeah, even forgetting stuff, but also, like, just uh, the, the moment of um, tactical play in theater of the mind and being like, okay, I know that if I play this right, I can be out of reach of this particular warrior because I know how far they can move and what they need to dash and all of this. And and then you're like, but in, I'm in theater of the mind. And if I play technically like that, it sucks for the mm -hmm. other people um, because it, you can't see it. There's no reference. And so I'm just wheedling out like, oh, can I get five feet here or there? And it's up to a DM to be like, yes or no. And it's sort of less fair for the other player to be like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm a, come on. Um, so I think there is, there's that as well of like, you're making a, you're making a calculation between what is 
all super tactical and what's like super the right move to make and what is like the move to make in the shared social experience that we're having. Um, and that's one of the things that sort of like comes to my mind. And then, and that's also why it's not like, okay, I have this spell that stuns you if you fail, so I'm just going to hammer on it. Like, okay, but it's sort of the same thing over and over. We don't get to see more of it. And that brings us to the flavor, which is um, I, I love it when you have the right justification to skin your character and your spells because um, D and D is great. You know, I know a lot of people get frustrated about D and D, and I think that's because of its position of power. But as as a game, it's a solid game, and it has a good imagination around it, and a good sort of generic fantasy that we have comfort with in general. Those of us who are like used to it, um, but it also we get stuck in it, and we get stuck in this sort of like okay. Uh, you know, this is the generic sort of this, this is the general pattern. And so if we're able to, to kind of like break out of it and say, it's fine that we have this like Tasha's caustic brew, but Kevin is from the mailroom and doesn't know how to cast magic. And so what is caustic in Kevin's world? Oh, it's a cup of coffee. And so when he spills it on you and then runs away his 25 feet, he's not running away. He's saying, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Can I find you a paper towel? Because he doesn't know that he's, like, caused you this damage. In So Kevin's reality is this is all an accident. Kevin's inner life is this is all an accident. And then if I can skin things for, for Kevin's perspective, then it brings... I think an aspect of interest as the uh, as the viewer to see the inner life of this person and how they are uh, how they have to adapt to challenges coming to them and changes around them, um, and so that's kind of that's one of the things that I like about skinning things is it's not just for for coolness in my mind but it's as much to show like what is the inner quality of this person. I think that's how I how I go about it is like really imagining what is the inner life of the character, what is the the reality and texture of the world and how does what they're doing, how do the mechanics sh reflect that and show that? Um, I think that's in my mind like the point of mechanics is to simulate a world, a, a suggestion of this type of world. And so when we lean into mechanics, how do we show that? How do we show how how does how does this magic or this swing of a sword or this particular skill? Why is it so hard this way uh, or easy or whatever it is? And how do we and like um, how did the character come to that moment? The other great thing that flavor does between the player and the DM or the other players, but I find it especially great as a DM is when my player gives me the flavor as the dm i can say oh this is how you imagine the world working fantastic i the more you give me of how you think the world works the more i can incorporate that into my world building and so then the world can work how you want it to but i can use it to tell our collective story more deeply i might skip into it, it brings us a little bit close to a question I have, which is, do you have any favorite traits for DMs or players? And I think we've sort of danced around it. I think I could guess, but there's no harm in <laughs> vocalizing it. Yeah, I think that like one of my, I, I always, I think I always come back to this, uh, just this like base word of like kindness. Mm. And I don't know why I come to this, um, but I always feel like the worst thing to, is to be at a table where there's where I feel like there's an animosity or conflict on the player level. And I'm really looking for just like um, the raw kindness to each other and acceptance. It's kind of like um, when we do our improv work here, we have these golden rules that we follow of uh it you um we use listen agree and support and so the listening is like taking in agreeing is like the yes part and the support is the and part right mm. um 
agree with the world and then support the world building. Uh, and so the more that we can do that together, and I think it is really a, like empathizing with other people and being kind at the table um, and seeing GMs who are like really celebrating their players is great. Um, even in high intensity moments, I'm currently working my way through the critical role downfall which is like level 20 brennan lee mulligan with a bunch of level 20 gods and he's thrown this impossible adventure like challenge rating uh fight at them and at the same time he is as uh excited about their success as they are even though he's like we got to make this interesting and, and hard um he's uh you know, generous and kind and giving and and excited about the work that they're doing together, um, and that's uh, that's beautiful. I love I love to see that happening, um, and also for players together when they're fans of each other's characters and want to see moments of each other's uh, characters working. Um, and I'll throw it to the work we did with uh, when I played Corinthian in what was it called the the. Close uh, Encounters of the Prom kind? Yeah, that close that yeah, that's right. Close Encounters of the Prom kind. Um, uh, I One of my tactics in that game was to try to have a scene with each of the other characters where we could have uh, an emotional character moment because the game had us in competition with each other. But I wanted to show we're all here together and we're all kind of like in this friend group who came even if the you know i'm the richest character and i'm kind of like potentially uh part of the backstory was that i've like invited them to my parents vacation planet and i i imagine that he like is essentially paying to have friends or whatever but i also mm -hmm. thought like if we can tell an arc with if corinthian can have an arc with each character it gives each of those characters an option a moment where they can have like uh an emotional expression and um we can we can have some sort of of story even though it is this fast one shot with a very competitive uh uh approach of like one of us gets to be prom lord um and so i was really aiming for that in this way this like i i want to hear from you and i want to have those moments with you i'm i'm excited about you watching that um stream watching that game and if you haven't seen it, it is the, the VODs should be up, I think. Please do go watch it. It it just made me think of the best example of why we play these games. And and for me, it's like, I can't watch movies these days without going, I think the writers play play tabletop games. Um, I think they've I think they workshop this in a game. Um and the opposite for this, which is like, this feels like the best teenage comedy that we don't have in existence, because what better way to kind of poke fun at puberty and the kind of awkwardness of it all than bringing the outsiders being aliens who are true, who are going to, speaking of uh, listen, accept and support, they're going to see teenagers and go, right, that's, that's okay. So all the things that we kind of feel embarrassed or ashamed about, these characters are accepting with open hearts and going, that's how we connect with these people. It's through these weird little things, um, which I loved. And to, to hark back to a a previous point when we were talking about Brandon Lee Mulligan on Dimension 20 and on Critical Role, there's something I learned far too late as a GM because I try to have very kind and wholesome and supportive games. And I'm saying this mostly to myself. It is kind to give your players consequences and have high stakes. Yes. It is kind because that's what they want. They don't want the soft Deus Ex, we've saved you at the end. If, they, if the dice are rolling badly, and they've walked themselves into a situation, make their choices matter. That's a that's an act of kindness you can show people at your table. Um, and I am guilty of sometimes not doing that, where I'm going, oh, that's okay, I'll, say, I'll save you, my little guy. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. I'll just, someone swoops in, don't worry about it. And I need to stop because it then punctures the enjoyment of the game. It then it veers into the, well, I, of course this happens, it's a dream, it's fine. Like, this is all making, yeah. it yeah. makes it less real, I think. Um, I've there done that. One? I've, yeah. I've done it too. Yeah, and it's like, mm, how do I make it stick better? Also, on on our stream, you mentioned um, the the uh, Telltale Deer stream. Hey, it's my first 
stream that I'm DMing. I DM at home as well. And I think, you know, sometimes I'm in there and I'm like, is it, are the consequences as strong as they could be? And I'm always checking that and being like, could I do, could it be more? Um, and I think the answer is like, probably. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it is hard to watch people you care about, but from player sense and from a character sense, go through something tough. Um, and I think it's part of the, the greatest challenge as a DM is not to, you know, it's not all the prepping, it's not all planning, it's not all the kind of scheduling and the kind of these, these idiots don't appreciate my genius. It's not all of that. It's the, okay, do, do nothing. Do, do not step in. Only honor what has happened and the choices they've made. I think that's us. To that I'm point. landing the plane, but I want to you to land point. with this point. Yeah. 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 I've, I don't think I've ever played a game where the people at it weren't bringing some part of themselves to the character, mm. even if they, like, I, I know people who, who are like, I try to play completely off type characters or little niche sort of like things. And when I think back on the pattern of it, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. If it's off type, it's sort of like that's your reflection in the mirror. It's so you, but just reversed or, or inverted mm. or whatever like you can't escape it um seeing it over and over as as constant patterns and then looking at my own characters and being like shit man let's like no matter how hard we try there's an element of us in there um but in my live shows i've actually started narrating a threshold of like and now we step through a gate, you know, a, an archway with stones and the runes glow purple and a portal opens. And now you step with us into the world of and then we enter into the improvisational world together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love uh, that. It's a really nice um, join hands, jump into this book, the, exactly. the world as you know it and the realm as you know it and physics as you know it, like leave yeah. expectations at the door and, and join us on this. You know, take the step that every theater goer or live show goer has to take, which is break the fourth wall. Like imagine, you know, mm -hmm. the, and it's it's the most captivating performances kind of do that. You get tunnel vision. It's like, and it's almost yeah. like when you're too deep in a book and someone pokes you on the shoulder, you're like, whoa, whoa, you just pulled me out of a different world. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a beautiful place to, to be in. Um, so thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I, yeah. um, I listened to Tinkham, it's like, ready for a 15 minute chat? I had a feeling um, we would talk and, and get on and, and have so much more than we've even covered, if you can believe it. Oh uh, it's one of those things I, next time I'm in Berlin, I'll just be like, hey, I'm nearby. Want to go get a coffee? Yes, yeah, please. We probably please, chat please. for hours. Would love um, that. But speaking of where people can find you, is there anything upcoming live shows, social handles, anything you want to let the people know. We'll also have it in chat. We'll have it linked. So it's all there as well. Uh, yes, there's some things. OK, if all right, first of all, you can find me at Water Mosaic on all social platforms. That would be Instagram, Blue Sky, Twitter, uh, Discord. It's just across the board. That's how I go by if I can get it. Um, you can also search my name and I'll pop up. Um, and if you're in Berlin, at the end of September, we have a live show in Berlin. And then the next week in the first weekend, I think it's Sunday the 6th, probably, it's going mm -hmm. to be a, another live show at the conclusion of Das Improv Festival, which is a big improv festival at the Comedy Cafe Berlin in Berlin. Um, both shows will be there. Um, I also, I'm working on a witchy podcast, actual play right now with a couple of actors who are not actual players. They're, they're actors, mostly with um, very little um, role playing experience. It will be a serial, serialized limited series using Wickedness, which is a game published by Possum Creek. Um, where it's a coven of witches and um, it will be a sound design, like immersive sound design, narrative, uh, actual play. Um, and it will probably run for, I don't know, 25 episodes or something like that. They'll be short. Each one is 
probably hopefully 30 minutes um, new format that we're trying out. This is the most I've shared outside of my close circle about it, uh, but I'm it's coming together um, and I hope that we'll be releasing the first episode sometime, probably late autumn at this point because we've had a couple of, of delays. But uh, it's I think it's going to be really nice. Um, so that's I've been talking about a secret project and that's what I've been doing. Oh, well, thank you for sharing like for a, a little bit of an exclusive, I suppose. Yeah, um, uh, I cannot express how thankful I am for you to come on uh, to to get to chat to you um, to talk about all some of my favorite things. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you so much, too. Hello, and welcome back to the present, or if you're watching this on a VOD, the past. What's um, it like in the future? I Well, Ben, apparently you're the one that can see through time and run through time because you were in a completely different location two seconds ago. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, I had to quickly change. That's theater practice, baby. <laughs> Quick back to Quick stage. change. Uh, yes, and um, Jacqueline uh, owes everyone a big apology. I looked it up. Courses for Courses is totally a real thing. I knew it was. I kept saying it was. Declan was like, no way, that can't be real. Um, but a real thing, which means, because this is an educational show, what's for one person might not necessarily be for another. So it's not every dog will have its day, Declan. Only an idiot would say that. Uh, it's the thing I just said. Uh, you are not gaslighting me on this. Uh, I will scroll back up through those comments uh, where... I kind of felt the sting of judgment from Grey's World and <gasps> BB uh, about my use of the phrase horses for courses. Um, and because... my facial expressions definitely aren't judgmental either the entire time. Oh, I'm I like... wasn't looking at you. Mm -hmm. I, was, I, I look at my own. <laughs> During the stream, I only look at my own <laughs> camera. <laughs> I'm not looking at you at all. Uh, uh, we, barely, we don't even look at each other when we're in, like, in the green room. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I had the absolute pleasure of getting to uh dm for jacob not once but twice uh during the the d8 dungeon drive and uh it, and i know uh jacob is in, in chat at the moment so i like i hope you don't think this is like i'd have said this if you weren't in the chat to be honest uh because ben and i when we were initially talking about this sort of this kind of deep dive into creativity and stuff uh, and we were like oh guests and stuff like that there wasn't a question uh in like Oh, who do we talk to kind of about that? Because uh, in, immediately after uh, the DH and drive, both Ben and I had this sort of like, I mean, is it fair to say, I mean, it might not be professional to say, but kind of crush on kind of the way. Uh, professional role-playing crush. A kind professional of, yeah, role -playing yeah. crush. Enamored by the performativity, the uh, performance uh, style. And, yeah. yeah, we had a real PRC, and I hope that is not an abbreviation for anything else, because right now it is professional role-play crush. Uh, uh, and we did, uh, because it was that sort of, uh, the particularly in uh, Kevin from the mailroom, uh, that character with that amazing sort of like uh, the crunch, I guess, because we we're, we're we're saying mechanics, but I think anybody in chat might kind of you know we're kind of more familiar with that sort of the crunch of TTRPGs, the crunchy stuff, um, and to see that kind of built uh, incredibly well, but then also played incredibly well and then performed incredibly well it was such a uh, it really was something to kind of step back from and go what the fuck <laughs> like <laughs> wow <laughs> there's yeah. a there's a lot yeah. of uh, there's a lot of things moving and uh that said um there were many others uh, with all completely different styles and like again horses for courses when it comes to these things um we're all saying it guys horses for courses <laughs> it's <laughs> D8 dungeon merch coming to a hot topic near you soon. Yeah. Courses for courses. Uh, um, but it is. Uh, I there was so that was the first instance, and then to completely sort of 180 it then for uh, close encounters of the prom kind on the Sunday game, which is a very much narrative led uh, kind of stuff uh, with a little bit of you know a little bit of the mechanics but it was mostly the story and the role play side of it that i i, I kind of lean into to see that still carry over 
uh, and to uh, guide the story was kind of an absolute treat. And like, you know, if there was a kind of a spectrum of mechanics and performance, like I kind of lean, I think more towards the performance side of this. Like I, it's something I enjoy way more. Like for me, and I and I said this, our prompt is the you know how do you flavor your character, and do you factor mechanics in first, or or, or do you do their mechanics factor in? I forget that there are mechanics, um, and. Like it's that thing of literally start with the class. Nope, I start with the person. I said this in the last stream, mm -hmm. so I always start. And even for my NPCs, um, I'm editing the current season of Romance of Dungeon at the moment, and there's an NPC, and I have such a crush on her. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, she's a really cool character. And I was like, oh, yeah, I flavored her this way. Oh, yeah, because there's mechanics involved, too. I'm going to do this. Um, but I don't know, but in what way do you... Are you a mechanics... I thought I've, when I'm making a character, sometimes it even just starts with a name. Like I remember on one of the homebrews, I, and this name came from uh, two guesses in a Wordle at one point. The Wordle of the day was Nasty. Uh, and the first thing I guessed was Shank. So Shank Nasty was just like in front of me on the screen. I was like, Shank Nasty is a great name for uh, a character. They ended, they ended up being a sort of PI, private detective Corgi in a trench coat, the Shrilby. Um, uh, in that sort of small chains, Tom Waits sort of style. So sometimes I start with just a name or even just a concept. I think I'm, uh, I wouldn't say famous for, but people who know me know I like coming to the table with, can I play a pile of leaves? Can I play a, a little tree stump? Can I play um, just sort of the concept of unings? Um, and often when I'm chatting to people, the question will be, okay, well, how does that work mechanically? Uh, and my brain goes, what? What, what do you mean? I move 30 feet when I need to move. I cast spells when I cast spells. I take HP off my sheet. It's almost like a separate thing. I'm like, yeah, the sheet will just operate. Don't worry about that. But like visually flavory, uh, I am a floating little worm dragon in the air. Like, um, and I think it breaks, I can see why it breaks people's immersion when those two things aren't, are totally misaligned. Whereas for me, and I've said this before, especially in fifth edition, if you can sleep for eight hours and be fully healed of like things that almost killed you the day before, we're living in Looney Tunes land. It's mm -hmm. cartoon mechanics, it's cartoon physics. Uh, so why can't there be a little dustbin on wheels who spins around the place <laughs> and talks by like the lid coming up and down? And is the lid the mouth or a hat? Uh, who cares? <laughs> it's both, don't worry about it. Um, however, speaking to Jacob, seeing Jacob play, uh, and seeing how easy it is to make mechanics a vehicle for flavor, a vehicle for story, a vehicle, not even easy, but like it takes a bit of work, but once the work's done, it's there. I think the furthest I've flavored AJ in romancing is I occasionally say I take three ar arrows out of my quiver instead of, so that's the idea is that he's just holding three as he fires. That's about it. Um, Maybe I'm being unfair on myself there. I don't know. But that's how much it feels like I'm just going, okay, my attacks, yeah, fire, fire, fire. Uh, and then, and then now that I've got that out of the way, a chance for a cool quip and some role play. Um, whereas you'll notice more going into season three, I'm going to try marry the two of them. Mm. Uh, in fact, I'm going to try start with the role play -y bit. Like, you know, I take a deep breath. I feel a sweat in my brow. I reach into my quiver, pulling one more out. out. I don't have a lot in me, but I guess I have to pull back and fire and almost see if I can last a season or a game without saying I attack or um, my AC is. Um, find ways to say that hits or misses that isn't hit, miss. It's, it is one of those things that uh, as a DM, sometimes I find myself going, oh, I wish... I wish the players would, uh, you know, would play into the combat uh, more uh, in that in, in that like it is, you know, I uh, my hands are shaking as I'm, you know, holding my claymore and I know that this is it. I'm 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 wounded. I'm badly bleeding. I my vision's getting blurry, but I'm going to throw everything I can into the swing of this uh, and I just grit my teeth and I swing. Gah. Uh but at the same time. Uh, and it's one of the headaches when it comes to editing Romance in the Dungeon. I love then I, I love when players go, 
Uh, so I'm going to roll for my attack, and I'm going to roll d20 and roll my damage, and yada yada yada. And I, oh, I do, I do my thing. And I, I get to flavor it. I get to, and I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I, I listen to uh, a lot of other podcasts, and I, because I love listening to other DMs and their approach to it. Um, and I'm currently listening to the third season of Dungeons and Daddies. Um, and the the DMs, if anybody is hasn't isn't keeping up with it, uh, DMs have swapped around. Um, and Will Campos is the DM for this story. And Will has a, as a DM, the players roll the dice and success or failure then turns to go, what does that look like for you? Mm-hmm. Like, tell me what that failure looks like. You you were trying to do this, you failed. How do you fail? Like, so describe it to me as you see that failure happening. And I'm like, that's, but that's my job. <laughs> but like I, and I, and I, and I, I had that rea- I, I did because I, I was listening to it on my headphones in work. And I did have that reaction to it of like, um, no, no, I now get to tell you what happens. Yeah, and I, and mm-hmm. as it kind of as I've been listening along to it, I'm like, this is actually a. You wanted to do this, you rolled for it. I am now going to give you the agency to tell me what it is mm-hmm. that happens and then i get to, to weave that into the the story then not the okay great you rolled great thanks you just sit back now and i'll do the rest of the job there for you so i'm i'm going to be taking a leaf from that style as well in that sort of because i think all of those things are going to go very well it, it also t- removes the possibility for this thing happening at a table and the thing is um when a dm starts describing the results of your like say a critically failed. It's like okay, well you trip over a rock and uh, you land on your face, and and your your uh, weapon flies out of your hand for a turn. As a player, you can sometimes feel like, okay, but I'm not clumsy. I'm not like I get it. It was natural, but th- that's not a reason to like throw a couple of digs in. Whereas if if you know your DM is going to honor the dice, but let you sort of fill in the gaps ultimately it doesn't make a difference whether they trip or like it gives the player an opportunity to be like i feel like i'm distracted actually very early early days when i first came down to play aj there was a role i was kind of brought in as like this elite scout who was very good at everything and i failed a couple of things and was able to at the table play it off as i'm very distracted by this new character i've met who i'm developing feelings for so it's not that i don't have the skill or the talent is my mind is not on that right now mm-hmm. um and for the audience, it gives them a, oh, I see where they're thinking and what they're doing. And in a Dungeons and Daddy sense, I think it's very smart because there's a player at the table uh, who's a little bit like Marmite, love or hate, and I tend to love, um, but has a habit of the DM will describe something and they go, no, 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 this is what happens. Oh, and they'll sort of, <laughs> yes, <laughs> got a whole ready. <laughs> it's like, ah, actually, I have an idea. And even if it's another player, they're like, no, no, here's, what, here's the thing. So for Will as the DM to turn around and say, well, tell me what happens if Freddie suddenly for the kind of love hate relationship people or like the love or hate that people have. I'd say the people who don't like that about that their play style feel it less this season because there's less toe, te- uh, toe stepping in that on the DMs descriptions in that way. Um, so recognizing play styles of your players at the table and DMing accordingly means that you don't get less of the narrative pie. Um, but the flavor of that pie is all the tasty. I I definitely think like any sort of like like with any session with any kind of TTRPG, uh, the the balance needs to be uh, kind of always. It has to be in everybody's kind of vision. You have it has it can't just be well. It's the DM now is that's the DM's job. The DM's gonna. I think all of us if we are going to open the mechanics up to that like uh, sort of. We're all carrying the the load here, not just the DM. I think then that means that we all need to keep an eye on those. So like that, my I guess my one fear with the I'm going to let the players now interpret that is the will they, you know, ah oh, oh, crit failed. Ah, it's not that bad. Like you know, there needs to be. I think again, mm. like any new rule, like any mechanic, there needs to be a clear picture of them. For everybody at the table, um, makes me think of two 
things, which is um, something I'm conscious of, especially in battle situations, is they take forever. So adding flavor and feels like you're taking more of your time. And we covered a little bit in the uh, in the interview that it's like um, you use flavor to cover the time that you need to do your math and your roles and all that kind of stuff. So you're not actually eating into more time. I'm also conscious we record a podcast and it's someone's job to edit it out. So if all my turns take longer because I'm describing everything that's happening, that kind of sucks. But we also do enter. It's entertainment. The point of it is to you know entertain or or occupy or or be something for someone. And I think in a situation where you have a player who doesn't honor the the nat one or the crit fail, I would really enjoy DM going. Okay, so you described a seven there. Keep going. Mm. Keep going. More. More. We're getting to a two. Keep going. This is a one. Keep going. Because <laughs> that interaction between people at the table is fun, and it's that kind of like. You're not being harsh enough on yourself there. So give me more. No, you don't get away that easy. Don't be don't be cheeky. <laughs> like, what did you do wrong? Um, so there could be entertainment in in that. Yeah, okay. Hmm. I again I it like as one of those things where you're like when you know when you're like when you you come across a new system or you come across something, you're like, oh, and then like, I, I, it's that initial sort of excitement. And even as we're talking about it now, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I just don't think I want to do that. I just don't think that's the way I want to do this. I <laughs> and and I and I, for for two reasons. One, it's 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 the part of DMing that I really get to enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. But I also, uh, I, like again, this is me kind of trying to grow and and like uh, develop those dungeon master skills or game master skills. Uh, I I have an awful lot of trust in my players around my table. Uh, for the story mm. and for the rules and stuff like that. Um, so uh, for me, a, a lot of the time I am just sitting back and I've put a situation out there. Great. I get to chill out for 45 minutes while you, you know, start riffing uh, completely and totally. And it's going off in a million directions. Uh, and it's great for me to sit there and let that kind of unfold. But then oftentimes my, from my perspective, the thing that I then do is the, I not reining everybody back in, but I start to kind of put the walls up around it where like, this is Mm. now a structured thing that we have just built. So now let me cement it in place. And this is the thing that we now have. And now let's move into the next room and do the next thing and build on to that. I, I, but I'm also, uh, you're, you're, you know, you're talking about that person eating into the time and stuff like that. I literally listened to myself describe hanging baskets today uh in a, in a in while i was editing the next uh, one of the episodes for romance in the dungeon uh for 63 seconds i described hanging baskets that had nothing nothing to do with uh anything other than i was printing a pretty picture uh and i went okay i can mention that there's hanging baskets outside because it's a bit odd that they're hanging baskets with flowers in it on a mountain um that's enough Cut. Nobody needs to know what's in the basket. Ugh. Well, funny you should say that because I used to describe things a lot and take my time and really sort of token it up, I suppose, to put it in it. Like, I'm going to tell you the texture of the leaves, etc. Going, I No one needs to hear that. Uh, and a player in Homebrew, Wes, was just like, I'm finding it very hard to picture where we are when you're just like, yeah, you're at a castle. And he's like, what's the castle look like? I'm like, I don't know, picture a castle, whatever your castle looks like. And Wes, as a player, was like, but my castle probably doesn't look like their castle. I'm like, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, and sat me down and said, start describing things again. Because I need that sort of runway of description to to settle and ground myself in a scene. Um, so I think there is a nice balance, probably. Um, but having learned that lesson, I would err on the side of describe more than less. Uh, I- I'm not ragging on myself. Uh, it, that this is, this was about four minutes into me describing the outside of this building. <laughs> so I was like, this, <laughs> this needs to get cut, cut down. <laughs> Which is sixteen agree. minutes into you describing the road up to the building. And... Yes, no, hundred percent. It's all the lead up to this. I'm like, oh god, like I'm literally, I'm that DM. Because uh, it's mm-hmm. like, and I, 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 I went into stained glass windows and everything, and I fully painted all the pictures of the stained. And I was like, that's cute. I'll keep that. But I don't think anybody needs to know that there is a little bunch of purple flowers and orange flowers because that had nothing. That was just me 
happily in my world explaining to the player what I was seeing mm. in my head. Uh, and myself and the player knew that going into it but from, mm. from, a, from an audience. And we're kind of gone off topic. Uh, but I'm going to bring us back because I want to talk about something in a second. But I, um, when it comes to the mechanics of things, uh, there's, I before I get into, because this, this, Ben, this might be a long episode. Cause, oh, I, I'll tell you what, I'll keep show and tell short, I promise you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, because I do want to kind of come back, but I do want to go to show and tell because I have something. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I also is... just need to look at my phone battery. Because you say it might be long, but it might be exactly the amount of battery left on my phone, huh? which is, it seems okay. Okay. I can go plug it in somewhere. Okay. Um, I want to talk about this. Uh, now I did not come up with this. This is not a thing that I developed, or I and I will do my best to try and find where I found the original video. Um, but it's in that sort of because uh, I'm, I you can't do this thing without mechanics. You need you need like uh, a system. You need rules. You need something. Um, but I am that uh, GM who loves to, uh, and we were talking about this previously, where it's like you know adding things into a game or flavoring a game a different way and uh, mechanics can be a great way to like use that because we were talking about even skill checks like how you can use skill checks outside of um, what you're looking at here is a uh, the cover art I did for a game called uh, We the Many and the whole premise was inspired by a video I saw on Instagram that was from TikTok because I'm in my 30s so all my tiktoks come through instagram reels um that's just the way the universe works um but it followed this idea of um uh, npcs uh, in a village overrun uh by monsters or bad guys and the players at your table play the npcs uh and away we kind of go with it uh, and i was like oh that's a really interesting concept uh how do i take that and run it and i ran this at at venturecon at at venturecon this year um and i was like this could be a this could go really really well or really really badly um and i ran it it was for an adults only game so ran in, in on the saturday evening um and with this idea of the people in the uh, in the game the people in the uh would first design the village uh so I had, uh, we had, we kind of gave 40 minutes to have them. I had graph paper printed out and you get to build the village. Like what exists? I put a river, I put a woodland, I put a bridge. That was it. That were the only things I contributed to the map. Uh, they were told there needed to be uh, at least one road that passed the bridge into the village. But they could have many more roads. Um, and they were allowed at any buildings anything they wanted uh, because my premise for this so i took this person's idea of what happens if the npcs fight back uh, i went hmm how do you get people to care about it um mm. and so i went well the, the, these are if i create the village they're not it's just it's not going to matter but what if i have them draw the village at the start what if i make them create the world that they're going to play in the space that they have to defend the sc- so they built a schoolhouse a pub two shops there was a mayor's house there were all these wonderful little like uh little tenement houses that people were living in there was these little farms all this, and then there was, there was one giant chicken on the farm um all these little things that they got to add they got to flavor and pepper into that space and i was like great wonderful by the way, uh, a messenger arrives to tell you that um, there is a band of uh, roaming bandits that are ransacking towns looking for ancient artifacts. And they're coming here in a matter of hours. So you have time to prepare a bit of a strategy, but they're going to be here and there are no heroes coming. Uh, there is not enough time to raise uh, awareness. So again, now marrying the original concept with my f- performative mechanics and they were able to come up mm-hmm. with strategies that i was not privy to like they were you're going to do this this and this and i get to then so if you've laid traps oh traps were late um and I kind of began to kind of unfurl you can see that there's the, the sorry it was one giant pig and three mm-hmm. medium-sized chickens uh that, that we had um and 
things that they put in, they were now getting to use. So mm. it turns out that in the woods, there was a cave and in the cave, so it's, it's like the rattling bog. Uh, and in yeah. the cave, there was a witch <laughs> and they went to visit that witch first, like to be like, hey, witch, give us some stuff that we might be able to use to fight the bad guys. Turns out they'd already grabbed the witch. The, the right. monsters, the bandits had grabbed the witch. Uh, but that meant that they now knew that the whole rumor about the ransacking the villages looking for ancient relics was a real thing. And then they were able to find some stuff that the witch, that they didn't steal from the witch. So now they went in slightly armed. Um, my mechanics then, because uh, they were trying to plan and plot and uh, figure things out. My mechanics came into Foray when it turned into a you're now fighting for your lives. You're an NPC, you're level zero. Um, and they had effectively uh, found a teleportation crystal um, that they hooked up to the cave where the rest of the villagers were. There were 100 NPCs uh, that I had written uh, that they were now going to fight off uh, a a small, like a, not even an army, but like a, a gang, a fairly formidable gang of uh, bandits, kobolds, goblins, you know, your, uh, your medley of like bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and the mechanic that I, I added into it was the, well, if your NPC dies, because they're, they're more than likely going to, they're not equipped for this. Um, you could actually sacrifice other NPCs to save them. Um, that mm. like th three NPCs would in the battle throw themselves at the monster and they would take it down, but in the ensuing fight they would die. And I had I had a couple of these kind of rules based around this. Uh, there were also kind of items that were available for them to use that like had they explored the village enough, they're like, oh that that weird statue that's in the middle of the thing that we drew. Um, that has a, a staff in its hand, but it turns out that's actually the immovable rod. Actually, no, the immovable rod was keeping up a pub. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was like the. It was. It was that one load-bearing beam, um, <laughs> and uh, a couple you know, little bits of these things that were kind of like, oh, if you find these, you can use these. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, what what happens if you give really powerful relics to um, NPCs? Um, and mm -hmm. it it was one of those things where I had these mechanics, uh, these little tricks that they could use to save themselves um and they never once used it came close it, came, it did come close at one point that uh they wanted to keep a character alive and it was that thing of like oh, i don't know if i want to sacrifice three innocent villagers in this mm -hmm. sort of thing and it was just um it's that sort of that thing that i like i had written i thought this is going to be a really cool thing this really interesting mechanic and the performance superseded it because the the player yeah. couldn't justify what they were doing to use that mechanic um and i guess that's kind of the way i i always kind of view these I, i'm a, a, a that big big believer in the the story um the story always comes first i think i don't know mm -hmm. if that's like i'm the, i'm the same like right down to i love milestone leveling but what i love more than milestone leveling is um and like uh, i'm guilty of this on, on homebrew where i'm just like yo level up um i usually do it at the end of a battle but it doesn't like i much prefer when someone's like i want to set out and i want to get really good at this and then like put them in a situation where they sort of like beat one they're bad at it beat two they get better at it beat three they've kind of mastered it and that's your you know 80s movie arc uh mm. of a skill so right down to unlocking new mechanics i like when that's story driven not just well i guess you get this now because it to me from an from a narrative point of view like take a wizard or take even a sorcerer like i level up and i've got new spell slots and, and like why can this person suddenly cast wind walk or like wall of fire or um like any lightning bolt when before all they were really casting was like spells that kind of weren't from that school or like kind of make no sense except for the, i know the player went online and said like best level three spells <laughs> like, mm. and it was like this is pretty good loadout um 
And so something I've never tried, I've never been able to pull off in a game, but I've loved the idea of it is saying to any magic user when I'm DMing something, don't tell me the spell, tell me the effect you want. And as a DM, because I've played magic users before, I kind of know what limitations to put on it. But if you're in a situation where it's just like, I see all those people coming and I just want to like to just stop them. And I'm like, now you're leveled up and you just cast fireball. Um, that feels better to me in a in, as an experience. Um, and so I love when mechanics and flavor are um, coincide. I've often wanted to play in a game where I'm a, I'm a caster, but I don't get to choose. Like I, I totally give across the my spellbook to the DM, uh, so they just kind of give me stuff. And with the tr trust in the person that they're going to give me good stuff. Um, because I used to play in a 3.5 game where I would just save up all my money and we'd go to a big town and I'd be like, I go to the magic store. Uh, and I'd be like, hello, magic person. I saved up enough for three new scrolls. Give them to me. <laughs> I want this one and this one and this one. And uh, the DM, because they were very, it's 3.5, they were super crunchy. We're like, you get two of them. The third one, I suppose what you're really telling this person is like they're a student and you're asking them to research it for a while and then hand it over to you. So you're just sort of paying for your homework to be done. And I'm like, yeah, that's okay. I, but I like even that was enough of a, that's how they had this on hand. They they mm. sent the scroll out to the Arcane Library and the Arcane Library is going, we'll get like three acolytes to work on this and we'll get it back to you in pretty quick because we're magic users. We can just poof it over to you. But it, there is a reason why, how is this magic store fully stocked with all these, like with the, the exact spells from this book called the Player's Handbook that I have? Or like this new expansion thing that I have. Um, so, so when it makes sense, and I say that as someone I know, like half an hour ago, I was just like, "Can I play Wild Leaves?" <laughs> so, but I yeah. so like, it's funny because I, I I I I thought we might kind of uh, you know differ on a, an awful lot more on this, uh, and there is still something else that I'm going to bring to the table that I don't know how you feel about it, but I um, I feel some way about it. I have like just on your point there around that sort of like it makes sense for my character to do it this way. Um, even talking about, you know, our game with Romance in the Dungeon, mm -hmm. all of you, uh, all of the players, again, it goes back to that, like, oh, I trust my players at my table. Everything you all do, uh, down to, like, even that sort of, like, AJ has some magic. I think mm -hmm. you've used it twice, and you've used the same spell twice. Um, yeah. Uh, and that was it. And it's that thing of like, he's just not really doesn't want to use it. He's never really trained it. He doesn't really know where it comes from. He doesn't really. And that was kind of it. Um, and like even like even down to kind of um, uh, Louise, who plays Fia, uh, is a rogue, but wouldn't classify herself as a rogue because she wasn't. She she's just really good at like paying attention to things, and that was her mm -hmm. job. She would go on jobs with her brother and her job was to be the lookout and she would just keep an eye out for the customer because the customer was going to be coming back so she's the scout and it makes sense mm -hmm. that as a rogue that's the subclass that she went with and um like the reskinning of a fester from a warlock to a warlock sorcerer uh mm. was done narratively it wasn't just a actually i'm gonna start taking levels in sorcerer because I want to do this is actually no. There's a reason why we you have it the way you have, and there's a reason why we're actually reskinning you. It was done with that in mind. Um, so I like that's something that you and I, I think, from a player point of view, but as a DM point of view, as storytellers, it is that thing of like mm. the mechanics are great. Yes, let's do those, but let's make it make sense. Like, why yes. can you now do those things? Like, or why are you now doing it this way? Uh, has to be a big part to it. Um, where I think we might, and I don't know, I don't know. Um, I, I, I had mentioned this to you. I, I didn't go into a whole mm -hmm. lot of detail. Uh, I don't know how you might feel about it, but, and I have, just before I cut to it, I did reach out uh, to uh, Marcus or the Chin individual because I saw this, it was, it was kind of serendipitous. Um, I, I saw this, where I was like, oh, that's going to be a great thing to chat about on today's show. Um, and there, Marcus, uh, who has DM'd for us uh, a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, on uh, D8 Dungeon Drive. Sexy battle wizards. 
this the season, progress. yeah, uh, and mm -hmm. Laser's feelings last year mm -hmm. um, tweeted uh, this uh, today. So, uh, your AP can be filled with the most talented dramatic actors on the globe, but the moment the rules of the game you're playing stop mattering, you might as well be doing an audio drama. So I don't know, uh, Ben, where you fall on that. Uh, but I, it was really funny. And I, uh, again, like I said, I reached out to Marcus to like, I'm, this isn't not me. Get him, everybody get him. <laughs> it, that's, that's not what this is. Um, I reached out to Marcus because I, I initially seen that tweet. And it was one of the things where I, when I saw it, I read it so quickly that I was like, wait, what? Like, mm. what? And then I, I actually stopped and went, oh, okay, read this first. Oh, actually, I... I actually agree with that. And the reason I, I, I kind of found myself um, kind of on that side of it, because origi initially I was like, wait, what? Like, I, I didn't know what way I I'd interpret it. I, like, I go, I go back to, uh, again, Romance in the Dungeon. Like, something that I, I always say, and I think um, even Amber, when they're doing PR for D8 Dungeon stuff, that will often say, oh, you know, Romance in the Dungeon, you know, we're a, uh, I mean, it's it's in our tagline, a soft core D and D podcast, um, mm. and soft core there is not that. Again, Jesus, this is the reason why I don't work in marketing anymore. I went soft core because you know we don't, we're not really a D and D thing. Uh, most people went soft core. I mean, you do you, you do soft core porn for Dungeons and Dragons? I'm like, damn it, no. Um, and I'm, I'm like, fans, I've been trying. I've been trying my best <laughs> to get it in there. It keeps getting cut out of the podcast. <laughs> like, you think so, I'm joking? I'm genuinely. <laughs> Uh, um, I oh. but I, we we often uh, uh, tread softly. You knew what you were doing. You Did can I, I you, you can still hear me. I'm just okay. double checking if I have a charger. Um, but stick with me, so you won't well, see me for a little bit. But I'm just making sure my phone <laughs> doesn't die. Just give me a warning. Um, yeah. We often would um, on uh, you know like it, it's that thing of like I would often say to people, oh. If you're trying to learn Dungeons and Dragons, don't listen to us because we're not going to teach you how to play. And it's not that the rules mm. uh, aren't there; they are. Uh, but it, it kind of goes to what the individual said in their tweet. It's it's that they kind of stopped mattering a while ago. Like, uh, do not get me wrong; I'm not going to break the system. I'm not going to. Um, Mm -hmm. suddenly kind of go oh yeah look i know it says here that the ac meets a beats a thing or i know here it says uh you know resistance is this but it doesn't or i know it's said to roll a d12 and a d8 but i think it's going to i'm not i'm not i'm not doing that uh i'm not i'm not going to we're mm -hmm. in and dragons because it's popular and we're actually playing pathfinder uh, but no um i believe in that sort of that my my story, uh, our story, the table story, the show, uh, is the is the. No, no, it's your story. <laughs> um, I. <laughs> is it though? Really? I mean, is it actually my? <laughs> no. Um, for viewers, what I'm currently doing is I'm moving a stool with a box of beer, with a laptop, with my phone on it, across the room to reach it. A much, cable. Like, much like the rattling bog i'm uh, moving a yes. <laughs> box of beer with a stand on it um but it's it, it it is that thing of the the story the narrative is the is the first thing uh in romance in the dungeon that's the first that is the most important thing so i i've always likened us more to an audio drama that uses D D uh for that sort of let's work out that little part of the story um here through this thing but it's the audio drama first i'm going to fix your camera because you've gone slightly off my i'm uh speaking of soccer i'm on my knees uh so in front of this camera we are good i okay. think i fixed myself um um but i think there's a very important two letter phrase that the ginger individual uses which is ap uh, and there's two types of tt or ett or pg content and that is the scale of actual play to narrative play um and i would say that romancing verges more into the narrative play uh versus an actual play because if you, you know when you really really think about it um sorry, i'm just <laughs> trying to figure out like wait to sit he's fidgeting uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. now i just look like an earthworm gym 
Um, the uh, the actual, I would agree, an actual play should be you actually playing the game. Um, and the challenge there is the other part of that, which is being the most talented, dramatic actors on the globe. Um, <laughs> I'm a brave man if I think I'll last long, kneeling on the floor in your 30s. Correct. Um, but now I'm, <laughs> now I'm hunkered down like a cool coach. I started streaming with my standing desk in standing mode and mm -hmm. I did eight minutes of that and I went, that's enough. My hip is sore. <laughs> so yes. good luck to, if you start to hear screaming, that's just Ben's knees. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge with an actual play is how to, how do you actually make it entertaining to watch and view? Um, and very talented people can't do that. It's funny, one of the parts of the interview with myself and Jacob that I ended up cutting was us um, stumbling across APs way back when in the sort of like, I would like to say 2012, when like PAX and the Acquisitions Incorporated group were performing live on stage. And I remember like scouring the internet to find any videos of this because there wasn't, wasn't anyone playing D&D &D live. And I missed being at the group. So I was in that situation where I was just like, is this going to be good? Is this not going to be not? Like, and then because it's in front of a live audience, it's obviously entertaining. But there are times when in looking for new shows, there's a, there's a fine line between feeling like you're the sixth, the invisible chair at the table, and feeling like you mightn't even be there. Um, and from chat, Jacob uh, Watermosaic is asking, is narrative play a real term? People are trying to use to distinguish from actual play. Uh, I first heard it, um, God, what was their name? They used to be the producer of Root Tales of Magic and oh, these those stars of space, but they took a step back. Uh, it will come to me. But they Sorry, were on, but I, but I, I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting all my angles in. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. There has to so be. For, I think I can do this. Hold on. There we go. For anybody that's, on stream who's been drawing us, I don't know, maybe that's a thing that you do that you've been mm -hmm. so you just ruined everybody's sketch. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um goodness. Goodness, what is their name? But uh I heard it being used uh, and being described in a Reddit thread, which if I go find, it's a really lovely breakdown on what they're trying to do and how at their table, not that the rules don't matter, but they only use the rules in service of the story. Um, and I'll find it and I'll post it up in the Discord when I do in our sort of TTRPG discussion channel. And if you're not there, it's sort of like this show, but all the time. <laughs> so, or like whenever topics sort of kick off. Um, more is their second name. But anyway, um, I will find it and I'll post it and I will get it out there. But that's I... to, to answer narrative play. Yes, that, that's the first time I heard it. And it was probably about four or five years ago, I think. Um, for, for me, like I, the, I, 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 so I agree, uh, with the, the concept of, uh, the, the, the kind of what Marcus was saying that like, uh, the moment the rules of the game, uh, you're playing stop matter, you might as well be doing an audio drama. Um, I, I, I kind of like about, and I and I'd love to see that Reddit thread actually, because uh, that that yeah. description kind of aligns with the way I have viewed um, uh, our our approach with romancing the dungeon. In that, like, uh, the rules help the story, not the other way around. Um, and mm -hmm. I, as somebody who um, as somebody who has, uh, you know, like I, I, I consume a lot of TTRPG content, uh, whether it's streams or podcasts um, or articles or whatever, you know, like we, and I know you do as well. I know like many, there's a reason why you're watching this stream right now, um, but it's. You're doing the... the thing we're talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, um I have always kind of, I struggle with uh, a lot of the uh, actual play content. Um, mm -hmm. And 
again, and I, I don't actually make a secret of it. You don't tell me what to do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, uh, there's, there's two things. I struggle with the actual play thing uh, where the rules are now at a point that it's hindering the progression of the story that we're getting not that we're getting kind of caught up in uh well this is this therefore that is that and oftentimes i i kind of feel like that those things work really well for that table but i i don't find that and again again horses for courses i don't find that i am making this work then um I don't find that style uh, particularly entertaining um, mm -hmm. because I do. I would go one step further and say it's not even in an actual play situation. There's a reason why a lot of advice online for DMs, which is like, oh, we're playing a game and then this one row came up and our whole gaming night dragged to a halt and was ruined. Um, and so, and a lot of the advice underneath that is just like, make a call in the moment. You can make a call next time you meet together if you, if you look it up after the fact um or designate a rules lawyer at your table just to keep the action moving but it's not exclusive to like it, this being consumable um because similar to what jacob was saying it's like as first audience it also should be entertaining <laughs> so and it also should be we're here to just, like i know there's there's two camps on we're here just to say collaborative storytelling versus we're here to play essentially a, a war game that has a fantasy skin on it um so I know that there is part of it is the crunch. Um, I suppose the if if we have if this episode has a thesis, it is that that crunch shouldn't be at odds with the collaborative storytelling part. And what we're trying to share is how to make sure that isn't. Um, but I 100% agree with you. I hate being. It's not even to do with TTRPGs. I hate playing board games where it's like, well, hang on a second, and then like. <laughs> Click, 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 click. Here, I've read it somewhere. It's somewhere here. Like, I actually don't think you can do that. It's like, look, I know this hinges on you winning or losing, but my night hinges on this being sh shit or fun. <laughs> so, you know, uh, what can you, what can you do? There's uh, Tretzofli said, I like the rules to a point. Uh, I think it helps players to choose their actions carefully. And I think a bit of structure is good, but when it comes down to scrutinizing ammo counts or pouring over material components for spells, etc., that's when I'd start to lose interest fast. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. I there's like how often, I'm, I'm generally speaking at my tables, I don't ask people to keep track of ammo. I don't ask uh, people to kind of have you got the spell components or that because uh, again, it, it is that thing. It goes back to Ben, what you were saying earlier on of uh, you just took a long rest and you healed up from fatal damage. Um, ta da! Um, so, I, 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 why would you, why would you kind of fall down on that part? But again, I have played at tables. You've played at tables? Why are, apparently, are you DM? I have, I, I, wait, <laughs> apparently, I've, apparently, I have DM'd occasionally. Um, <laughs> <sighs> this is uh, nobody for There's anyone watching nobody. the bots chat are uh lambasting us <laughs> no, not chat one person in chat uh, uh mm. who is literally they've all united chat, <laughs> chat have turned against us <laughs> and there is only one person in the world who would unite chat against us uh, mm -hmm. uh but there is only one person in the world that can make me stall in my tracks like that and that is emily uh or as i like to call them problem emily uh, That's well, very good. <laughs> they'll get that <laughs> reference. Uh, <laughs> I I have a um, like I because again I I don't want it to feel like uh, that I, I put because I I do agree uh, with the individual in that um, uh, like I, I I think kind of distinguishing between the type of stream or podcast that you are listening. To, uh, is important. Like I, I, I mentioned, you know, we, we we talked about Dungeons and Daddies there, um, mm -hmm. and in the uh, in that sense of, I would have said very early on that the first season of uh, Dungeons and Daddies is kind of what helped give me permission to run Romancing the Dungeon. Now I did not reach mm -hmm. out to Anthony Birch to go, "Hey, 
Anto, uh, I'm thinking of doing this thing. Is that cool by you? Baby, baby, it's me. <laughs> hey. <laughs> and he got back to me by WhatsApp voice note. It was 11 minutes long. Uh, and <laughs> it was mm -hmm. great. It was wonderful. Uh, but it, it was that thing of like, oh, hang on a second. They are doing it like that. I mm -hmm. can do it like that. I mean, I, I, I do it like that already at my, <laughs> that's the way I do it. Uh, but it, it kind of felt like, oh, hang on a second. There's space for these types of games where you are playing yes. Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but you're telling a story. And it just so happens to be that Dungeons and Dragons pushes the mechanics, push the story. Um, mm -hmm not the other way around and again and i know it's it is there in chat uh from water mosaic again that i think it does depend on what you're trying to do if you want a bit of a resource hungry tension count ammo and money and stuff this create this can create like a thriller or horror sort of situation and i again that's in saving grace um spell slots uh were like it was a thing of like mm, that's not a, that's not a long rest you didn't get a long rest mm -hmm. uh, you got a like you, you got a short kip, uh, which was barely half a short rest, and uh, you fired off uh, half your quiver of arrows. You have half a quiver left, and if you didn't spend mm -hmm. the time, which you couldn't, getting them back, sorry. Um, and if you didn't yeah. get them back, they might be doing less damage because they're not as sharp because they bounced off a wall. Um, yeah. These kinds of things, where the story still is being pushed by looking at those mechanics. Um, mm -hmm. that, like I, I want to do X. Great. Uh, well, you do know this is a survival thing, and you are running out of these things because you keep pushing yourself to that point. It it reminds me of X. Uh, I cut my teeth on well way back when, like uh, Hero Quest. So you had literal resources as you went around the map, being like, I spend this thing, this thing breaks, yada yada yada. And then I played the bulk uh, of my teenage years was three point five, um, and so it just kind of embedded in me that thing of like i go into a town it's like right so i need bat shit uh, i need some can of wax i need the fleece uh, from my sheep i need this 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 and like my dm was kind of have they weren't role play moments it was just like okay take this one to go from your inventory add those things in it's like great cool no problem but i don't particularly enjoy games where it's where it's the 10 foot pole thing where it's like well you didn't say you were carrying a 10 foot pole poking everything going through to make mm -hmm. sure that you weren't saying like everything has to be said or else it didn't happen like we well, didn't say you had breakfast so you're hungry now um but i do think i agree with water mosaic and chat there is fun in in running out of stuff like one of my favorite video games is the last of us and it is exciting when you're down on your last couple of bullets and you're like i don't have i have to think my way through this somehow and it forces it forces narrative role play moments what i would do for like ammo or any sort of like resource is I would have the depending on how plentiful their area is I would have the character roll uh, d6 and for every and they've six slots almost and for every one they get after every battle now they have five slots now they have four slots now they have three slots now they have two slots and so that they can get down to a thing it's like I'm taking a risk by firing my bow because even one shot after all this d6 and if it's a one that's a sixth of my resource gone um but it's not getting the way story and the other thing is uh going back to the tweets i also dislike and it's not a very prevalent attitude but it kind of exists when i'm uh, listening to some shows or watching some shows which is like okay we're kind of playing D, &D i guess but <laughs> whatever that's for nerds and losers so like we're guess we're doing it it's like you're playing the game like why are you why are you not leaning into the rules why are you not using the mechanics why are you not like I get that part of the point. You might as well be doing an audio drama where it's just like, I don't like when people who are using something as a vehicle sort of shit on the vehicle. And I'm like, well, no one forced you to play this. So, but maybe you saw that there was like potential and like attention here. Maybe you saw there was the world was looking in this direction. So you're just kind of capitalizing on it and you'll move on to something else in a while. And it's that way with sometimes when like I watch a show in a world I like. And the show itself is a little bit like, uh, yeah, I guess if you're into this sort of thing. And you're like, I am. That's why I'm watching it. Like, why are you making me feel shitty for caring about the thing that seemingly we all like? Um, and it's a danger. It's the danger between the too much rule of cool, too much like, well, let's not bog ourselves down with, with mechanics here. We're not 
those kind of nerds. And it's like, I'm sorry, you are those kind of nerds. You're playing, you're playing the game. Like, to enjoy it, embrace it. You'll find more fun in it. Um, it's okay to be a little rules lawyer about it. Um, because why wouldn't you? Without making someone feel, like the other side of things is, I don't want to make someone feel bad if they don't know a rule. It's like, hey, we're, like, don't sit down and learn it all. Yada yada yada. Like, it's okay not to know something. You don't have to be a super fan of something to enjoy this game. Um, just don't, just don't like belittle the people who happened to um, either. Just be fair. Be kind. Be kind. It comes back to that. <laughs> be kind. It comes back to horses for courses. <laughs> it does. Everything comes back. Everything comes back to horses. Of course, I do think. Like, I, I often kind of feel like, Jesus, we say that a lot here on Ben and Jack on a roll. Would you not just talk to your table and set it out very clearly? Hey, this is what we're doing. And for me, as the game master, for me as the player, I actually like the rules and I like the system and I like the the crunch and the mechanics. Are we all okay with that? We are all cool with that. And um, we're all okay that like sometimes we bend them a little bit. And sometimes it doesn't matter that we're, you know, it says on this page that you have to have X, Y, and Z. Um, I, can we set that out very, very clearly at the start? Uh, because ultimately uh, it comes back to that collaborative side to this. Mm -hmm. You're not playing a solo TTRPG. And if you are playing a solo TTRPG, great, good, have fun. But you're playing with players one, two, three, four, five, hopefully not six around a table. Uh, but you want to make sure that everybody there is playing the same game. And okay, we're playing D&D &D 5e, great. These are the rules. This is what I, these are the kind of the things that I like and set those things out. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Does anybody feel we're going to go, It's it, you kind of want a bit crunchier, less crunch, more mechanics, less mechanics. What way do we want to feel this out? It, like so much of what we talk about here uh, on Ben and Declan on Roll always comes down to just talk to the people at the table, like coming coming to the table. Um, and that counts for, I'm running a one shot at uh, an event. This is the way I've set it up. Uh, this game is going to be for those of you that want your hardcore mechanics, that you want to do this. And likewise with your shows that you're going to engage in. Um, there's nothing wrong with being that actual play that sits there and, you know, the the movement is tracked across this and half cover. And it, when you don't technically have that because 100% because there mm -hmm. is, there's an audience for that. Um, I'm not that audience, um, but that doesn't mean your show is uh, any worse or better than mine. Um, and you will, you will find, you, you, you'll find your group, you'll find your players, you'll find your, uh, you'll find your tribe effectively. It comes down to, again, and again, uh, I think Water Mosaic had said it as well in that sense of people will gravitate to what they like. And if people want more audio drama, whether you want to call it audio drama or you want to call it a narrative play. Um, and I, I'm not, there's a whole, there's a whole other episode there in distinguishing narrative and actual play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cause where do you draw, where do you, where do you start to draw that line? I think is a really interesting um, question to be considered. Um, but I do want to uh, just thank uh, this individual for helping to prompt that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, it clearly, because even chat were kind of excited by it. I dropped in um, Marx's uh, X uh, account there, uh, they're the Chin individual. Uh, Marcus uh, streams across uh, a, a couple of platforms and stuff like that uh, with uh, Horde of Tales and Euphoria AP, uh, but also puts out their own content on their own YouTube channel, uh, exploring uh, various modules and bits and pieces for systems. They're, I think they're doing a big thing on Pathfinder 2E at the moment. Um, so would strongly, strongly encourage you to check out. And I'll, I'll drop their details over on the uh, Discord as well uh, in TTRPG discussions. Uh, I've listened to a couple of Marcus's um, uh, shows and kind of interviews and stuff like that, and it's just a, a, a fantastic uh, and really sort of interesting uh, person to just kind of like 
get their thoughts and inputs onto it. Um, I think uh, also uh, the water was like I said, this is a big old conversation right now in many corners. I'm not sure it really super matters personally, but I think people also think it's important for bringing an audience. It's complex. Yep. Uh, it is <laughs> ridiculously simple, but it's also incredibly complex uh, in, in the same time. It, it, and I think the best way to sum it up, courses for courses. Uh, that's the... Courses for courses. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, it's not really a phrase for me. Be honest um do you want to but do, do we have an episode about this where we... yeah it's like i don't know i don't you know i don't think that phrase personally is for me but i suppose it's, it's kind of a horses for courses situation here it really is uh it really is yeah. while we're um accrediting uh input from this uh for this episode i did look it up yeah uh, it was taylor moore taylor moore from fortunate horse was the person i'd originally seen it read a post i from need to find that fortunate post. I will. horse for fortunate horse <laughs> Yeah, uh, and produces. Um, I think I think this information's up to date. But uh, worlds beyond number, the kind of Brendan Lee Mulligan, Brian Iringar, New Wilson, and Eric Age vehicle, um, which is very narrative play. Uh, so it makes sense. I think they have. A, I think Taylor Moore has a specific interest in narrative versus actual play, and finding that distinction for the exact reason of audience people coming to shows and being like, "Well, this doesn't feel like an actual play." It's like, oh, okay, we need to distinct. Like, it's setting expectations. Like. No one's ever disappointed when expectations are set and met. Uh, every horse enjoys the course. <laughs> that they chose themselves. That they chose <laughs> for themselves and expected to find. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, is that us? That is, close? Did, oh, okay. Yeah. That is, I think so. Uh, but we're not, this is. I mean, yeah, we can talk for two hours. <laughs> yeah, <we're not. laughs> uh, uh, I, um, th we are, like uh, Ben mentioned at the very, very start, we are delving into mm -hmm. creativity and we want to look at it from so many different facets, so many different aspects. Um, and kind of th the whole premise of Benedict and Honor Roll was that we wanted to look at all things TTRPG um, and uh, not just, let's discuss the crunch and the mechanics. Let's not just discuss this new system. Let's also look at people who... Uh, exist within this space that you know you might kind of not think oh hang on that doesn't really you know that's not we we are going to be talking to artists who create uh, uh, character art world art um, for TTRPGs and where they're drawing their inspiration from what do, are they players themselves or is this just something that they do um, you know uh, for their own art or for 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 money what, what, whatever it might be um, we're going to, like Ben mentioned, we're going to be talking about burnout and that real, uh, I, and I, I think with that, uh, I, I, cause I do see it falling into that direction of, um, kind of even imposter syndrome that kind of comes with this mm -hmm. space. Uh, I, 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 not, not that burnout and imposter syndrome go hand in hand. Um, uh, but from a, that point of view of, it can be a symptom of burning out that like, oh, I'm not doing good enough i'm not doing x y and z enough um and yeah we've uh we have some really wonderful uh folk uh folks coming on board to help with those conversations and to kind of steer those conversations and you saw that we kicked off uh with uh with jacob this evening um and like ben said that interview went on for over an hour um and we had to, uh, we 57 minutes uh but that's me hitting record we were also talking for a little bit before too uh, and I, I and i can't wait to talk again <laughs> um so it is and it, like if you are uh if you are a player a dm an artist a writer a musician and this is your you you see yourself in this you are in this space and you want to talk about mm -hmm. your your own experiences hit us up it's ben and declan on a roll at gmail.com uh you can catch us over on the discord um, I do quickly want to make mention of uh, Jacob's uh, website again. It's just uh, jacobleftin.com for more information on Jacob, their work, and their own links and stuff like that. So do make sure you check that out. Um, there's anything else, Ben? I don't know. I don't even have my stupid little skits uh, with me. That's, that's fine. The usual worry. kind of, yeah. So, okay. Uh, I mean, I can make one up, but it never goes well. <laughs> no, 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 you're, you're okay. Uh, we, we all saw the, the angles were your skit. We could replay the angles. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I will say that uh, if you are on the Discord, I mentioned that 
uh, there would be a Romance of the Dungeon uh, and Bed for the Bodge. You've got this out if you want. Uh, that's totally fine. Uh, no, 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 no. It's amazing. There's a uh, tomorrow. <laughs> if I edit the bots, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if I do any work on the bots, the starting soon is still there. People have to cut through. <laughs> um, there's a uh, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Uh, season three of Romance in London kicks off uh, with episode one, Courting Punishment. And uh, with season three, you've already seen the phenomenal title card and artwork uh, that was designed by Dahi C Design. Um, and if you haven't, you'll see it tomorrow. Uh, it's a, a beautiful piece that helps kind of encapsulate what's happened the last two seasons and sort of is a wonderful motif for what's yet to come. Uh, but that is then matched by the brand new theme song uh, that we have uh, for you. And I absolutely love Romancing the Dungeon season uh, season one's little beat because it was like it was really fun, it was really cute, uh, it was a really nice way to kick things off. And then last season, season two, we had Haunted from Ghost of Red Mountain, and uh, a, a wonderful piece uh, of music that again helped kind of encapsulate uh, a huge part of the show. And we leave because this is the final season of this arc of Romancing the Dungeon. Um, and I have a feeling it's going to end rather explosively. Um, I hope. I hope so. Uh, I plan to. I will see. Uh, but it, it's, there's. I, I want there to be. Uh, anyway, the theme song we have uh, was uh, written and performed by Stephen Tynan of uh, Left on Red. Uh, an Irish-based uh, uh, band. And uh, Stephen uh, had uh, Abby Soiree come in and do uh, the vocals uh, for our theme song. Uh, and uh, now I am delighted that we end tonight's episode of Ben and Declan on a roll, uh, giving all of you who are here with us in chat a chance to hear the full theme song uh, and it's uh, it's a freaking banger. Uh, that's the only way to describe it. And if you're going like, I'm not from Ireland, what does a banger mean? You'll know what a banger means after you've heard this, because uh, this is uh, ace. It's it's everything I had asked, and I only asked. I only gave like two sentences. Uh, I was like, this is what I want. Please do something with it. And from that, they made this. Um, so while that is gearing up, we are going to raid another channel. We're going to keep the keep this going. But I do. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who joined us in chat this evening. Uh, thank you to Jacob for their time with uh, Ben and the interview. Uh, thank you to Ben uh, for, well, for his time uh, and for being here. Yeah, no, no, thanks for bearing with uh, being in a, a new home. I'm, I'm minding a dog. I do that sometimes in my spare time. So thanks yeah. for sticking with me. And thank you, Declan, for uh, for always being a very uh, lovely co-host and for uh, pushing, uh, for inspiring creativity in me. Uh, and just at that point in time, Toby the dog has come over to me <laughs> and landed on my lap. Um, but hold on, I can do, I can do, I can do there, like, there it is. Oh, look at him. <laughs> I'm a capitalist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, on that. Roll uh, the music. Yes. Uh, have a good evening, folks, and we will see you very, very soon. <laughs>